Director of Research. Brown Foundation Director of Research at Recovery, and then also our colleague, uh, Dr. Lorena Gaffaro, who I've seen constantly on Twitter. Please, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she is uh, she's our, our Twitter uh, guru and, and media specialist who is helping us uh, reach out to everybody you know throughout the U.S. and, and she's uh, she'll be presenting tomorrow at the POF. So please. Uh, Go up to her and say hello. And if you have any project, anything related to U.S. Latinos and digital humanities, please talk to her. And so today we are honored to have uh, Trevor Munoz here at Arte Publico Press and Recovery, who is uh, visiting us from the Maryland Institute for Technology in the Humanities, where he is interim director and assistant dean for digital humanities research at the University of Maryland Libraries. He works to foster digital projects that involve close collaboration between librarians, archivists, and other digital humanities researchers. As part of this work, he has written, spoken, and consulted about the strategic opportunities and challenges of doing digital humanities work within the institutional and cultural structures of academic research libraries. When he also an MA in digital humanities from the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College, London, and then MS in Library and Information Science from the Graduate School of Library and Information Sciences at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He currently serves as co-principal investigator for the African American History, Culture, and Digital Humanities at the Initiative. And so we are honored to have him launch this series this, this semester. Um, we are humbled that he has been a partner, a supporter of us, of our work, and uh, with that, I give you the floor, Trevor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I wanted to start by saying a huge thank you to Gabby and Carolina and Lorena for bringing me here and inviting me to speak. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've uh, been hearing about this project over the last year as, as Gabby and Carolina have been racking up the airline miles. <laughs> traveling around and um, visiting many, many digital humanities centers around the country. Um, and so it's nice to be here and visit you in your space. Um, and thanks also to everyone at the Recovery Project and Arctic People Go Press. I've had a lovely last couple of days. And so um, this is a really nourishing place to come and visit and do the work of digital humanities. Um, if I could just stop and take advantage of the fact that we're a relatively small group. Um, at MIT, when we started talk, we actually asked everyone to just say their name and where they're from. And I'd love to get a sense of who's in the room. Uh, 
Um, my name is Athena Valdez, and I am from Rice, Michigan. I'm Crystal Seahorn from the University of Houston in Sterling. I'm Lindsay Graham. I'm also from Rice University. I'm Tina at Recovery Media. Thank you. Um, the work I'm presenting today is some early stage thinking, um, reflecting on the work that we've been doing at Maryland for the last couple of years. So I'm actually excited to have an opportunity um, to try out some ideas on you and hopefully we can have a conversation. So I welcome your feedback at any point. Um, feel free to toss your hand up and ask a question. Um, part of the project I'm trying to undertake here is to describe in sufficient detail to give people an idea of the conditions, the material conditions under which we're working and how they're shaping the work we're doing. So particularly if I'm omitting details that would help you understand what we're doing, please let me know. Um, so I titled my talk today, Beyond the White Digital Humanities. And to begin, I wanna make clear that this title is not a claim of novelty or innovation. There is rich scholarship by and about people of color that engages the digital. Likewise, this account will not follow a progressive narrative. I do not mean to imply that the digital humanities are a vector for moving past, or to use the phrase um, that was au courant a couple uh, years ago, for bracketing the issues of bodies and identities. Um, I think any familiarity with the rich body of scholarship I just mentioned would make clear just the opposite. So indeed, the last part of my title, The White Digital Humanities, cuts against any connotation of post-racial fantasy with its retrograde flavor, as it is meant to. Um, if we must attempt, as Kim Gallen does in the Debates in Digital Humanities volume from 2016, to make a case for the Black digital humanities, then we should not allow the alternative to go unmarked and thus leave the possibility that it will be mistaken for the whole. We must continue to see that there is a white digital humanities and to interrogate it such that we do not only find ourselves asking why there needs to be a Black or Asian or Latinx digital humanities. So the argument I'm going to make today is that to be beyond the white digital humanities is not temporal or teleological, but that we could think of it as being spatial or better perspectival and imaginative. So like Sylvia Winter's Demonic Grounds and the further extension of this concept by Kathleen McKittrick, or like Simone Brown's surveillance, the beyond of beyond the white digital humanities is a mode of producing knowledge. It is that which plots imaginaries that are oppositional and that are hopeful for another way of being. And that's a quote from Brown. As a cisgender hetero man of part Mexican-American ethnicity who has nonetheless benefited from the privilege of presenting mostly as white, especially when meeting in person and trading on the informality of using first names only, uh, where the NA is not visible. <laughs> um, taking up space in this beyond is not my role. And I want to be very clear about that. I have the privilege to direct a well established and well funded digital humanities center at a major research university. And I hold degrees in digital humanities and in library science um, based on programs of study, which, while excellent, um, and don't tell them I said anything bad about them did not, as Gallen would have us do, consider how any connection between humanity and the digital requires an investigation into how computational processes might reinforce the notion of a humanity developed out of racializing systems, even as they foster efforts to assemble or otherwise build alternative human modalities. So for most intents and purposes, in my personal experience, in my training, and in my institutional position, I am the white digital humanity. So while I am co-principal investigator of an African-American history, culture, and digital humanities initiative at HUNE at the University of Maryland, um, this talk will not propose a new formulation of Black digital humanities. I refer you to Gallen's definition of Black digital humanities as a technology of recovery characterized by efforts to bring forth the full humanity of marginalized people through the use of digital platforms and tools, a definition I think that would resonate well here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or to Jessica Marie Johnson and Mark Anthony Neal's definition of Black code studies and this special issue of the Black Scholar devoted to this topic as queer, femme, fugitive, and radical, a refutation of conceptions of the digital that remove Black diasporic people from engagement with technology, modernity, or the future. I would refer you to the almost 300 scholars who will gather on our campus at the University of Maryland in less than a week 
mm. <laughs> uh, for Adium's Intentionally Digital, Intentionally Black conference. Uh, if you want to know more about the Black digital humanities, look there. Likewise, as I said, I'm deeply honored to be here at Recovery, where they are creating the first Latinx Digital Humanities Center, and I would not propose in their stead to offer a definition of the Latinx Digital mm. Humanities. So what I would like to do instead is to describe my experience as part of the Adhume team and specifically to reflect mm -hmm. on how we have defined and redefined the ground of our project in order to gain a better view of what it means to work beyond the white digital humanities. I will focus on the arena in which I have lately done most of my work, uh, leadership and administration. This is a covert way of saying that I do more budgets and hiring actions <laughs> than reading theoretical articles. Um, nonetheless, I think it's an interesting arena to consider some of these theoretical questions around uh, the white digital humanities. Uh, so my thinking has been immensely improved by collaborating with the ad team, team. Dr. Catherine knight Steele, Dr. Jessica Liu, Kevin Winstead, Dr. Javon Bickerstaff, Melissa Brown, Kurtam Lindback, Glad, Ed Summers, Will Thomas, Megan Fitzmorris, Dr. Bonnie Thornton Dill, and Dr. Daryl Williams and all the participants of our ad team reading groups, conversation series, and incubators. As I said, this is work in progress and is my personal reflection on a deeply collaborative, uh, multi-authored project. And so any shortcomings of insider analysis are, <laughs> are solely mine. <laughs> and so the central idea I want to explore through, um, through several readings of the way that our project and the, the way that we've talked about our project have uh, evolved is to is this notion that the beyond of beyond the white digital humanities is not in the words of black studies scholar alexander Haley. i always get that wrong mm -hmm. um, um, an identitarian land claim concerned with particular borders of exclusion nor is it a universal terra nullius right um, and following grayson brillmeyer's application of allison caper's political relational theory of disability the archives. We can also think of the beyond in which we are interested as a pluralized political site that is ever changing and always in relation to other people, environments, and attitudes. And we can draw in the multiple and expansive histories and entities that co construct the site of the digital humanities. So, this shift, I believe, leaves the white digital humanities marked and thus open to approaches that allow us to find and expose the things that otherwise lie hidden beneath piety, heedlessness, and routine. And that'll be partly the story that I'll tell through these readings, is how the familiar language of the competitive research university, um, of which the digital humanities has been uh, mm -hmm. you know, a highly functioning part um, for many years, um, has sort of evolved and groped its way towards some other way of trying to do the work that we all uh, wish we could do. Um, so roughly the course of the next uh, little bit here will be to talk about um, going from sort of traversing this network of three concepts, um, which are three principal ways that we've talked about ad um, So synergy, intersection, and center or centering. Um, and I hope this is more than self-indulgence because what I'm actually gonna read you is uh, a piece from the grant proposal a piece from the earliest posts we have on the website, which thankfully we've not updated, <laughs> and then a piece from our recent call for proposals um, for the conference that we are having later. Um, so first, uh, this is from the opening of the original grant proposal itself. We wrote, in an effort to address two of the most significant challenges in higher education today, technology and diversity, the current initiative proposes to advance and expand the fields of digital humanities and African American history and cultural studies, and to develop and diversify the pipeline for the next generation of scholars and professionals who foster engagement at this intersection. I've been with the with the project since we were writing the first drafts of the grant, so I'm responsible in some way for all of the verbiage um, that you'll see, um, and some of which I I wish now to be able to critique. <laughs> um, so I think there's a couple things that are interesting about this um, language, right? First, um, this is really one of the first and last times that we mentioned diversity as part of our mission, which isn't to say that diversity isn't part of our mission, but I think um, if you look at the work of feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed, mm -hmm. um, diversity is, is a term that has been 
largely co-opted by institutional um, forces and thus doesn't really give us the critical purchase on issues of um, what it means to think together digital humanities and African American uh, history and culture. Um, but initially it was framed as being about a technology mm -hmm. diversity problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that shows up again in, in the appearance of pipeline, right? We've all heard about pipeline problems in science, technology, engineering, medicine. The idea that we just need to train more junior scholars, women and people of color, um, to fill up the ranks of the professoriate, um, where now research shows that, of course, we don't have a pipeline problem, we have a retention um, and reward problem. Um, plenty of women and people of color engage with technology um, and then find themselves alienated from um, the academic life. Um, the other thing I want to note here, thinking back um, to the point about um, territorial claims and sort of that view from nowhere, is this language about advancing and expanding, right? This is a clear, um, and I mean, this is grant proposal language, right? We, mm -hmm. Many of us have written this, right? We have to make claims about why we should be given money. And one of the first claims we reach for is to, you know, enhance the territory occupied by this thing that we wish to validate for us. This um, critically informed African American history and culture and digital humanities will be bigger. We will expand the frontiers. Um, and then I think, um, sort of leading into the next section, this last bit about foster engagement at this intersection. Um, and so this is the first place where kind of the next term that would come to dominate our thinking appears, this idea of intersection. Um, though I couldn't really tell you um, what we meant by foster engagement. I think it's a, <laughs> it is a um, purposely uh, blurry word. <laughs> Right, um, we will do stuff here. Let's call it foster engagement. And I should also make the point. Yeah. So okay. Good. So this next bit is from, uh, you know, we submitted the proposal. Mellon was very supportive. Um, we, we got the money, um, and then we were announcing the grant. Um, and this is the language that we posted on the College of Arts and Humanities website in announcing this grant. The title, the phrase you see here, synergies among digital humanities and African American history and culture, synergies, mm -hmm. was actually the original title of the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, so originally the, the project was called Synergies. Um, synergies will cultivate disciplinary transformation by bringing African Americanists together to develop the tools, methods, and archives needed to address their research questions in a digital humanities framework. So we've gone from diversity and pipelines and expanding territory to now frameworks and disciplinary transformation and also this idea of synergy. Um, synergy is an interesting word, right? Um, to my ear, it has a ring of business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we find synergies among different units so that we can um, lay off half the people who do more work with fewer. Um, but this idea of combining forces and thus enriching each part of this new combination. Cultivating disciplinary transformation actually comes straight out of MIT's mission statement, which I'll show you in a little mm -hmm. bit, um, which is in the process of being rewritten, but has, has included this language for a long time. Um, and I think shows a lineage of rhetorics of digital humanities as they're entering this project. Right, MIT as a digital humanities research center founded in 1999, conceived of itself as engaged in a process of disciplinary transformation. That was part of what the digital humanities would do. Um, we would convince skeptical or reluctant colleagues that digital methods were, you know, the new way of doing things. Um, it had increased intellectual power, um, and we would slowly sort of convert and transform disciplines in in the digital humanities image kind of a problematic concept, I will admit. Um, but this language appearing in Adhune comes straight from that tradition of the digital humanities rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the humanities academy, that this will be transformational. Um, and largely um, in one direction, right? The academy will become more digital. And the last part I find fascinating um, because 
nowhere else does this framing appear. Um, African Americanists uh, developing tools, methods, and archives needed to address their research questions in a digital humanities framework. Right in this in this version, the digital humanities becomes sort of the organizing rubric, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that African American methods, tools, and questions will be fitted into. Um, and so, on the one hand, you have this claim about disciplinary transformation, at the same time that it feels like you have this matrix already set of the digital humanities. Um, we know what it is, right? It's the framework around which we're going to do all this other work. Um, so where where will the transformation come from? I think this you know increases our reading of this as being unidirectional, right? Mm -hmm. If digital humanities is the framework, then what will be transformed? Well, the study of African American history and culture. And there are specific claims behind each of these items in the sequence: tools, methods, and archives. Um, you know, we went on. We pointed out in the grant proposal what is still true: that there are far more digital archives related to white canonical male figures than there are to um, figures of um, people of color. Um, that the methods and tools um, are often developed at wealthy institutions and are not um, always equally disseminated to all the different types of scholars who might wish to use them. Um, so there are some places here where this is anchored to a specific narrative about um, what is the state of digital humanities and what is the state of African American historical and cultural studies? Um, but largely, this is African American history and cultural studies being fitted into the framework of digital humanities. Um, so we had um, synergy. This is our first, our first pass, right? This idea of we're either expanding the territory or we're increasing the power. Of, of these two areas. But there's enough language here to make us doubt, you know, which where where the emphasis is falling. Um, and really, I'm, I'm harping on this because this has been part of the most important conceptual work of the project, um, from which many of the activities um, have flown, have, have, have flowed, right? Um, how do we imagine these two sort of conceptual arenas in relationship to each other? Um, and this is part of the larger problem that I want to draw attention to with this idea of the white digital humanities, right? Um, to mark the white digital humanities is to conceive of it in relational terms to a black digital humanities or a Latinx digital humanities, and not to assume that the white digital humanities or the unmarked digital humanities is the totality, um, but that these other approaches are constitutive of a digital humanities whole and can't be. Um, discard. Okay, so this idea of synergy, um, and as you remember, the next term is kind of rearing its head, <laughs> this idea of intersection. So I can tell you that nobody really liked talking about synergies, um, and many of us started to talk more about intersections. Um, though I think we did like this phrase, advance and expand, sounds good, right? Um, <laughs> So um, before I go on to, um, let's go back and, and treat intersection a little bit more. So synergy proposes this somewhat transformational idea, whereas intersection is a different metaphor altogether. Um, you know, two roads meeting in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, there's perhaps some kind of exchange Though I think um, if we look at perhaps um, science studies or cultural anthropology um, in the Geertzian uh, vein, right, we're not even talking about here about like zones of exchange, right? We're talking about an intersection. Um, the paths meet and then each is gonna carry on along the course that it was already on. So why, why did this you know, metaphor become appealing? I think because it changes the dynamic that was problematic in the examples I've just been discussing about transformation and who has the privilege of, of doing the transforming and who will be transformed. That intersection was a more neutral and safe word um, to speak about you know, two trajectories intersecting but remaining, if you will, on their own heading. Um, 
And but I think the limitations of this concept of intersection, you know, follow from the metaphor, right? It's not as rich as a zone of exchange. It doesn't, um, you know, except maybe in the concept of like hanging out on the corner. Um, you don't do a lot at the intersection. You, you mm -hmm. pass through, right? Um, so I think that's a, an interesting metaphor, which took on strength from being a counterbalance to this idea of transformation and the problematic of figuring out which way the transformation would go. And before I move on to this, to the last term in my sequence, um, centering, I want to point out that this is by no means a unique move to add to to think about centering. That other black studies scholars have made this similar move in other domains. Um, and so this is just one example that I think is, is nice and clear. Um, Catherine McKittrick um, in her book, Demonic Grounds, um, which is really a study of um, how spatial thinking and geographic thinking can help us read um, um, black feminist texts and think about the position of the black woman. Uh, she writes, however, rather than building my, my argument around questions of absences, for example, who, what is missing from the discipline of human geography, I consider what happens conceptually and materially when black studies encounters the discipline of geography and blackness is imagined through specific geographic inquiries. And I think we could look at this quote and we could substitute digital humanities where she says human geography, right? Who, what is missing from the discipline of digital humanities? Um, and what happens conceptually and materially when black studies encounters the discipline of digital humanities and blackness is imagined through specific digital inquiries? So one point here is that the move that Adhume has made um, toward a metaphor of centering is not unique to the digital and it's certainly um, not our own invention. Right? We are following the tradition of previous um, black studies scholars. And I think that this framing by McKittrick is particularly valuable um, because it gets at uh, a problematic that often comes up in discussing African American history or, or probably the history of any people of color and a supposedly sort of dominant technological paradigm like digital humanities is this idea of absences and what to do about them. Right? I think um, many of us are well enough practiced now at saying, well, I know that there are silences in the archive and I can trace you know, the contours of power um, that have created uh, the archives from which I'm, on which I'm basing my research and I can understand why certain people are not represented or why they're only represented as subjects of a sort of colonial or state gaze um, and not in their full humanity. Um, we've gotten better at making that move. Um, but I, I feel the frustration, and I know many other people feel the frustration at that being only half an intellectual gesture, right? Mm -hmm. To say, I see the absences, and I've put some kind of disclaimer on my data set, right? I'm going to do a text mining project, or I'm going to do a visualization. And we all know that there are absences that are distorting this, but nonetheless, on we go. Um, and I like McKittrick's framing here because her move towards centering um, gives us somewhere to go from the question of absences, right? Not to simply stop and say, there are absences. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's valuable work to be done in tracing how those absences came about. But what if we want to continue to work with those archives or with those technologies, do we do next? And she gives us a, a conceptual tool. Um, this idea of, of centering and imagination, right? The idea of being of beyond the white digital humanities as being perspectival and imaginative. And so my last quote here is from, um, is from our recent call for proposals for the Intentionally Digital, Intentionally Black conference. Um, so we say, what happens to digital humanities inquiry when we begin with black culture Black thought and Black person at the center of our endeavors. Mm -hmm. How does this shift challenge and expand both the humanities and the digital? What happens to Black and African American humanities research when we lead with the digital? And I think in this quote, you can see um, the thinking in transformation, right? If we're not all the way there, 
Uh, we certainly wouldn't claim to be all the way there. But we have sort of fastened on this idea of what happens when you center black people? Um, how does that change your practice? Um, even as the hallmarks of expansion and leading are still there, right? There's still some problem about how to put these two conceptual universes in relationship to each other. Um, but we have a new conceptual tool about decentering whiteness and recentering uh, blackness, or perhaps the experience of Latinx communities or disabled communities or other our indigenous communities, um, other places where we can center our attention. Um, and to try to make this a little bit more concrete, I want to talk about how this idea of centering blackness played out in the program. Right. So I've been trying to describe by sort of reading our own, um, you know, messy drafts left out there in the world, this kind of conceptual movement we've been making in terms of the metaphors we use to think about the relationship between African American history and cultural studies and digital practice. And now I want to try to give a practical example of like, okay, but what did that actually do in terms of our activities on the ground? Um, what what made what did this make happen in admin? So I want to talk a little bit about how um, this programming that we call the Digital Humanities Incubators became something that we're now calling intensives. Uh, the Digital Humanities Incubators were a programming structure that MIF originated um, in 2012, I think, um, you know, as a way of thinking around the problems of having Digital humanities support be focused on particular faculty members and their particular intellectual projects. Um, so, as a digital humanities research center with a mission of trans institutional transformation, right, we had to think about how to get people to do digital humanities. Um, and so, one of the solutions to this from time immemorial was give people faculty fellowships, right? So, give a faculty member time off and resources and get them to do a digital project and their work will be transformed see the promise of these new approaches. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that it's incredibly slow. <laughs> you can only touch one, maybe two faculty members at a time unless you have a gigantic support staff, um, which nobody does. Maybe Stanford, but basically nobody does. Um, and so we eliminated the faculty fellowship program, and we created this program that we call the Digital Humanities Incubator. And so already we were trying to move from a very individual, single author focused model of digital humanities, an enormous amount of investment in a single project, to something that was more uh, cohort based. Um, so instead of teaching one faculty member how to make their specific project, teaching a room full of people how to take a certain set of technological approaches and encouraging each of them to sort of use it in their own projects and following up and trying to help everybody a little rather than helping one person a lot. But also trying to encourage people to learn from each other, um, to exchange ideas in the mode of an academic seminar, right, to get away from uh, this, this service model that is deeply embedded in faculty fellowship. So as I said, MIF had created this structure um, before Adhume ever came along. And so we wrote it into the proposal for Adhume. Um, and we were all set to go. We said, we're going to have incubators for ad Um And we have. We have had things that we call incubators. Um, but they are different than they were before ad -Hume came along. And part of it has been trying to understand what it means to do this work of centering, um, centering black folks, right? Um, so we did a sequence on digital mapping, our first year of, of public programming. And the first set of gestures um, by people who were not accustomed, myself included, were not accustomed to working in black studies was to say, well, we know how to teach digital mapping, but instead of having examples with white people, we'll just have examples with black people. Um, that doesn't work, obviously. <laughs> like that's not actually a, a black studies approach to this question of digital mapping. Um, because in conversations around developing these workshops with our with our colleagues on the ad team, um, rather than saying being able to jump into the lesson about digital mapping, 
and say, all right, we're going to get a data set. It's going to be a set of points related to some aspect of black life. I'm going to teach people how to use this mapping platform, uh, Cardo, and we're going to teach them how to put this set of points on a map and visualize it. We had to pull back and say, what is the provenance of this data? Uh, where did it come from? So I remember a session where we spent a long time looking at the Digital Harlem Project. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Digital Harlem Project. Long running digital humanities project, right? There's plenty of work in this area. The Digital Harlem Project is, is well established. And one of the, the maps that you can access through Digital Harlem is, well, you can actually access a lot of maps through Digital Harlem. But if you look at the subject of these maps, you see that they're maps of like, arrests. You see that they're maps of accidents, uh, deaths. Um, so we had to ask ourselves, well, where did the data that is driving these maps of digital Harlem come from? Well, they came from municipal archives, archives of the New York City Police, archives of New York City, right? This was the gaze of the, the city government on the, sub, on the citizens of Harlem. And so what did the government care about about the citizens of Harlem? Well, overwhelmingly, it cared about crime and social deficiency and all these things. And this then would become our map of Harlem. That wasn't right. Um, which isn't to say that there's no value in mapping something like a data set of police uh, information, um, but that it needs much more contextualization. Um, and it needs much more interrogation of the nature of the data um, prior to even putting it on a map, right? My claim is that there's really no point in putting an arrest data set online um, as a way of representing a black community. Um, like there's, there's really very little value there in doing an initial visualization, right? What's really valuable is interrogating that data and thinking about, all right, why is this the data that we have? Um, where does it come from? Are there other data sets that we could use to supplement this? How do we contextualize this? Um, because visualizations have power, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we put a bunch of dots on the screen, <clears throat> we're, we're humans, and we think we mm -hmm. can see patterns and understand something about a community. Whereas if we're beginning from this data set of arrests as a representation of the black community, then our analysis is not likely to go anywhere useful. Um, and so this was a kind of a priori before we could even do what we thought of as like the basic digital humanities moves, right? Get the data set into the mapping platform and show people, right? Um, we were stopped, right? We had to rethink our approach. And this led us to a series of conversations um, where the structure of our incubators was usually 90 minutes, um, which is what we've done previously, which is you know kind of enough time to teach people the beginnings of a technical something. You know, you help everybody get through the errors on their computer, you have a shared data set, everybody comes away with some kind of primitive looking digital something, right? Um, and instead, for Accum incubators, we would find ourselves spending half, two thirds, three fourths of the time talking about these issues of data provenance. Um, the whole mapping conversation became a conversation about surveillance. Um, so not only um, does mapping the police data set, not map the black community, but rather the white gaze on the black community. Um, and thus we would label and we would contextualize and we would describe the map differently. Um, but also, even if we had a data set of something that was say community generated, um, there's a recent example in a paper in Big Data and Society of a community group working in West Atlanta, um, who was motivated by the inaccuracy of um, of a city data set about um, housing problems, like blighted abandoned buildings, to create their own data set. Even if we had a community generated data set, what does it mean for the lives of those people to create a digital map of it, right? Um, it's one thing to have you know, the data tables, it's one thing to have it in the control of that group, um, but then as we start making visualizations out of it, suddenly aspects of this community are more visible um, right, we've exposed them. Um, and how do we think through the ethics of doing that? Um, is actually making a map of everything mm -hmm. the best approach? No. Mm -hmm. um, and so then what are our alternatives? Um, and so, as I said, we found ourselves spending a lot of time in 
in supposed skills training workshops talking about issues of surveillance, talking about issues of ethics. Um, and I don't want to portray this as being caught up in preliminaries, right? I want to argue that this is actually the vital dimensions of what doing Black digital humanities work is, right? It wasn't that we were clearing our throat and trying to get to doing Black digital humanities. This is doing Black digital humanities. And so just quickly, um, the idea of moving from incubators to intensives is a way, it's essentially like we're rolling all of our greatest hits of programming into one nice package. So in addition to incubators, we hosted a reading group where we were having people engage with the scholarly literature um, from Black Studies and the digital. Um, we had conversation series where we would put together senior scholars of which Maryland has a, you know, a luminary crew um, from Patricia Hill Collins to Mary Helen Washington, Bonnie Thornton Dill, um, amazingly strong scholars in African American history and culture, but most of whom are not particularly digital. Like they came up in a different set of traditions, have done amazing work. Um, so we put them in uh, conversation with younger scholars, many of whom were citing their work or informed by their work, but a but pursuing it through digital uh, humanities approaches. So we had a very memorable panel, including Bonnie Thornton Dill and Patricia Hill Collins, with our faculty director, Catherine Knight Steele, and a graduate student, Melissa Brown, having a conversation about black feminism. And Melissa Brown, um, who's one of our success stories, who really embodies what acting is about, could talk about the way her study of how black sex workers in Atlanta are utilizing Instagram um, and how they're moving around the city and you know, managing their business and survival um, was informed by notions from um, Bonnie Thornton Dill and Patricia Hill Collins' theoretical work many years earlier. Um, so we had this conversation series, we had the reading group, and we had these incubators that suddenly looked different than if incubators had looked before. Um, and so we put them together this year in this new set of programming that we've called intensives which incorporates um, you know, a scholarly talk about a research project. Um, so you, know, you can't divorce the digital methodological work from what impact the scholars intended to have in their home discipline. Like if it's a historical mapping project, we need to know why studying the you know, location of black populations in North Carolina in the, in mm -hmm. or the recover, uh, reconstruction period is important to historians. Um, and then we engage with a couple pieces of theoretical scholarly writing, right? The digital humanities is still part of the humanities traditions where we write things, and read papers to each other. <laughs> um, and then combining that with um, this version of the incubator that situates technical skill development in the context of this theoretical and scholarly work. Um, and that is one practical outcome of this move from a synergistic model to an intersection model to a model that attempts to think about what it looks like when you center black folks in doing digital work. Um, and I just want to end with one further quick note. Um, I promised I would show you a little bit about MIT's mission statement. Um, so this language has been around for many years. Um, you know, our mission is to be a world leading digital humanities center that pursues disciplinary innovation and institutional transformation through applied research, public programming, educational opportunities. And that's a pretty good description of what we try to do every day. Um, and you can see where those phrases of pursuing disciplinary mm -hmm. innovation and institutional transformation came from in that ad hoc proposal. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to. Um, talk about how we moved from being a center that had a mission statement um, to a center that has a mission statement and a value statement. Um, so over the last year, year and a half, um, my colleagues and I have um, spent a lot of time talking about the values that drive our work as MIT. And this, this was really prompted by thinking about how we relate to the Adhume project. Um, and uh, the, the value statement, which is on MIT's website, um, is a co totally collaboratively authored document among the six of us who are the core staff of MIT. Um, and I think it's an important um, signal to go beyond just having a mission statement to having a value statement. And this um, last paragraph is actually the one I wanted to talk through uh, today um, in closing. Um, so 
Um, there are a few, a number of values spelled out in that value statement. This is the last one of them. Um, we write, we acknowledge that inclusivity is more than just making others feel welcome. It also requires giving regular attention to working for justice by changing systems and structures of privilege and power in which we are embedded. This means recognizing or respecting silences in the cultural record and seeking to collaborate with underrepresented communities. Um, we spent a lot of time on this text, which doesn't make it amazing text, um, just that it was a lot of work to get here. Um, and the way that it relates to the rest of the talk is I feel like this end of the value statement is beginning to move in the direction of how do you run a digital humanities center in a way that makes possible a move beyond the white digital humanities. Um, this idea of, oh, we'll just have our existing digital humanities program, we'll have our incubators, and we will invite the new disciplinary community of African American history and cultural studies into them, right? We will have African Americans working within the framework of digital humanities to being something else, something that really makes possible some other kind of transformational move. Um, and it is this idea of um, a different a different position, a different perspective, a different imaginary, right? Um, where instead of just having people occupying our space, being next to us, being at our events, thinking about what are the ways that myth, that's a very powerful, privileged site of digital humanities work, can um, work to change systems and structures of privilege and power. Um, such that it is possible to imagine being beyond the white digital humanities rather than reinforcing and reconstructing those norms that have brought the field to where it is today. Um, and that has been really transformational for men, and it has been a real privilege to work with ADHU. Um, we continue to think about um, how we are um, how we are tied up in the project of the white digital humanities. Um, despite the many projects, uh, many diversity projects we have done over the years, um, how structurally and in the material conditions of the kinds of work we do, um, we continue to foster a white digital humanities, um, and how we could change direction and begin to be part of, um, to be allies to uh, a black digital humanities or a Latinx digital humanities or whatever digital humanities wishes to come into being. Um, so I think I will stop there. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much for your talk and it's, um, it's very motivating to see that this type of work is being done and um, but what I did want to ask how can we engage with white DH scholars who see our work as too political, mm -hmm. especially in situations where we don't have access to a place like Adhu or a place like Arte Público that we were working with um, Latino DH. Mm -hmm. how, how would we approach that situation, especially because in, in library environments, a lot of the time it's white DH scholars? Yeah, no, that's a fabulous question. Um, and hopefully you will help me think of think of some answers. Um, I think it is I think it is largely acknowledging and fighting at a disciplinary professional level to say like this is a political project, right? Like you can't claim to be just doing digital humanities, right? You are you are engaged in a political project of the white digital humanities. And we have to be able to mark that and see it so that we can acknowledge people who are saying, there's no place for me here, right? Um, I would, you know, because I would often, I would guess that often the, the library or the other space, you know, doesn't even realize that they're doing white digital humanities, right? And it's certainly not the way that they would advertise it to themselves, right? <laughs> Nobody, um, Nobody is going around going like, yes, we are the premier center for white digital humanities. <laughs> um, or at least I hope not. Um, so part of it is refusing that frame, right? Refusing the frame of saying, well, digital humanities about, about people of color is political 
and other digital humanities is apolitical. Um, and I think also it is combining forces with those fields and programs and departments who are have already been engaged in that work for many years. Um, so, you know, the Women's Studies Department, the Latino Latino Studies mm -hmm. Department, the African American Studies Department, right, who have all confronted these issues before us. Um, because um, I think acknowledging that it's political causes us to think about what are the political moves and resources that we know work, right? So we can think about coalition building, right? If I'm not at a rich institution or I don't have a digital humanities center at my institution, with whom might I you know, join forces or work in solidarity such that we could have a distributed network of people supporting each other. Um, you know, so like FemTechNet and the FemBot Collective are two examples of this for feminist scholars, right? And so being explicit about the fact that it's all political, I think gives us the chance to think about, okay, well, we need to be building political coalitions um, that help help us make space and gain resources to do the work that we need to do. Um, that still doesn't feel like a fully satisfying answer to me. Um, so I'm open to other thoughts. Hi, well, uh, I don't know, like I had the experience on ACH when we were creating the cultural papers that it mentions that we in inherently receive social political work. And one of the comments was that many people will not submit to the conference because of that work, because that will um, make them be in trouble in their work, especially for sciences. They were like, if I attend that conference because of that, because of that work, I can, um, he was mentioning that many of the scientists will lose their, many of the engineers will lose their job because of that. So I think it's more than like the issue of political, it's a structure that doesn't let you go further. And is that like many, want to work engage with them but it's the issue that sometimes is not recognized on and as you mentioned the data i i saw it on torn apart like how it was all this data available but how you have to be really careful with it because even though you want to become political and you want to make a change you can also get into the trap of visualizing something that has, that, that doesn't need to be visualized or that needs to be visualized in other forms. But I wanted to ask you about, so for the data, how do, how do you work with that? How do you handle using data that it's available when you're representing this kind of communities that are marginalized, that you can fall into the trap of continuing with the discourse of violent communities or that it's all murder on these places. How do you how do you work with that? So I think one example is or one one aspect of it is is kind of the alienation of the academy from the communities that are supposed to support and be invested in it. You know, so if you were actually in dialogue with that community, you know, would you have made that, you know, error of going and getting, you know, like a police database, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they would probably not point you at that as a database, as a data set about their community, right? Um, and so by being in dialogue with them and listening to what their ideas of self-representation you would probably find yourself working with different data sets, right? Whether they be <clears throat> oral histories or photograph collections or a number of other things. Um, you know, that said, I think there are also people who are thinking about ways to work with data imaginatively, um, which sounds kind of funny because it, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't conform to a kind of like positivist scientific a way of thinking about data sets where we, you know, we have data and we test our hypothesis against it and we you know, sort of verify certain things are true or false, right? It's an oversimplification, but um, to use data as an imaginative resource um, 
So rather than um, you know putting those points on the map and letting them seem to speak for themselves, um, mapping some other set and po po positing those arrest values as absences, right? Um, so perhaps taking that arrest map and looking at looking at it not as a site of where the black community is, um, but where it isn't, or making it a map about where um, where the white gaze is encountering the community, right? You know, what is it actually a map of? Um, I think a lot about a really powerful sequence in um, Claudia Rankin's American Citizen, um, where she looks at uh, lynching photographs, um, and what she did was. Um, she took, you know, these, you know, photographs of these horrible events, you know, the body hanging in the tree in the crowds um, at this, you know, kind of spectacle. Um, and she removed the body um, so that you only see the faces of the white crowd. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, she makes the point that mm -hmm. when she looks at things like videos of police killing African Americans, she doesn't see black bodies, she sees white rage. Mm -hmm. um, and so that question of like, what is the figure and what is the ground? So I don't have a, a clear example of a data set that you would work that way, but taking that as an imaginative example and editing out what seems to be there and focusing on what seems to be the background, um, like Rankin did with those photographs, mm -hmm. I think is a powerful way to think about data sets that's a humanistic, artistic, imaginative mm -hmm. approach to them rather than a, a remote, analytical approach. Yeah. You started when you talked about the grant announcement and you mentioned um, it was a little problematic to, kind of, to talk about the digital humanities framework mm -hmm. and transferring the asset, right? I'm wondering what you think is more problematic, that we presume that there is a digital framework or that that can be used to talk about the digital I mean, I think, I think they're both problematic. Which one I think is more problematic? <laughs> I mean, I guess I don't, I don't have a problem with the idea of African-American studies being transformed, like all fields need transformation, and there are, in mm -hmm. fact, valuable things that people have done in African-American studies by engaging the digital. Um, and so that is a transformation. I guess it is the pairing of those two things, the transformation into a known framework where we assume we know what the digital humanities is, but this journey that AFAM is going to take is indeterminate. Uh, that's, that's what seems problematic to me. So I guess it's in the combination. Um, and partly it's because, so I was at a, at a conference last week um, where Sophia Noble spoke, um, and she issued a challenge to the digital humanities, um, which I wish I'd been rapid, fast enough to type it all down. Um, but the, the heart of it was that the, the aperture of attention is too small, right? Um, that because that like even though the digital humanities has made arguments about say the materiality of digital technology, it hasn't yet extended those analyses in a lot of ways to say like the global supply chains that create technological devices, right? So like Matt Kirschenbaum has done work about you know the materiality of data, right? Is the, you know the magnetic residues on you know like the the diskettes and the hard drives, but to expand that analysis further to say like this supercomputer that I have in my pocket, this is a point that Lisa Nakamura made, right? This digital device, almost all of them have been passed through the hands of an Asian woman before it ever came to me. And the, the rare earth minerals that make the chips possible, you know, pass through the hands of black miners in Africa, um, you know, working under terrible conditions. So like that I think is the exploding of the digital humanities framework is to say, mm, if you think you know what digital humanities is, then perhaps your aperture of analysis is too narrow mm -hmm. and you're bracketing these issues of culture and bodies and you know, material conditions. Um, so that's part of it. I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, 
appreciate that response because it actually leads me to the other question, which we can, I guess, sum up the question, um, or maybe it'll turn into a question. So right after you talked about the grant announcement, you also talked about the concept of intersection. I think it was still part of the grant announcement. I can't remember exactly. Um, and you talked about it as neutral and safe. And I can't see intersections without thinking about Gloria Alpula and the process. This notion that Florida is not neutral and safe, but really actually a journey of sorts. Um, not a pass through, but if you put this really on that, that central space, that is where like, really cool goodness happens and not the value character that jurisdictions create some of the um, and so when you answered that response, and then you went into this question of well, we could just put the black location on the map. And I, when you said, I, I don't want to say we need to get through this moment to get to doing the DH work, right? Because at first I was like, well, when are you going to start doing the DH stuff? You're just talking about, um, you know, what's problematic about the map that you guys have, the data you guys have. It seems like you then sat a lot of the rest of the conversation in that intersecting space. Um, can you just explain Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's an area where the, my analysis could be deepened. And I've been <clears throat> starting to do more reading in this area. It's not a theoretical literature I'm just familiar with. So I was, um, we were you know, really grateful to have Lorena at NIP. Um, and you know her references to Amber Wheel's work um, and thinking through some of these issues. Um, so you know thinking with the work of folks like Lorena and into those theoretical literature was a way I think I could extend this analysis further. Um, because I guess without that theoretical apparatus, the intersection did seem a kind of decontextualized metaphor um, mm -hmm. to us. And I think it was because we had more powerful metaphors from the Black Studies repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, so not only this idea of centering, which McKittrick takes up, but um, Christina Sharp's idea of the wake, um, as you know, Black Studies being in the wake um, of the slave ship, of death, of all these things. And so I think it was just, there were other metaphors from the community we were engaging more directly that were informing our work. But I would love to push it further and think about how the, this analysis of the theologians could make this better, so thank you. I also saw, because I wanted also to touch about the intersectionality, <clears throat> because I'm working with, I'm using intersectionalities for my study, but I, ha I was reading about interlocking, mm -hmm. because it's not just passing by, it's becoming part of it, and that's when the center mm -hmm. gets created. So I don't know if it will be something to use also. Intersectionalities and interlocking. Yeah. And I think interlocking gets to this mm -hmm. idea of like connection, maybe transformation is not clear how that plays in there, mm -hmm. but it's more complex than just passing through. Yeah. And and you were right when you said like we did spend a lot of time and we talked about spending a lot of time as at the intersection. Mm -hmm. So we did spend a lot of time yeah. there, but it had it didn't connect mm -hmm. for me. And in the sense that takes that goes back to my first point, right? It's like if we if we have like this train of the DH framework and the African American transformation coming through, they don't they aren't neither of them are altered after that pass through. Yeah, and that was part of the rhetoric, right? That yeah. both would be transformed. Yeah. Um, but I think the slippage was when you try to you know rephrase or restate, yeah. you see you know some of the latent assumptions about what's changing, what's staying the same. Mm -hmm. That our work to like you know get through those I, well and I think not to right it would be tempting to just like erase that you know digital humanities framework one right um, but to acknowledge right that like this is actually the structures of power that have created it such that this seemed like the way these two things fit together mm -hmm. and to explicitly then say like we have to make a move beyond that um, out of that space. But I think it's really powerful how you mention about the process of changing words or like going in deep into the work, because 
you acknowledge that when you put it into practice and it's like well diversity sounds beautiful mm -hmm. but into practice it's something completely different mm -hmm. so i think it was really interesting to see how it is framed and it looks so awesome mm -hmm. but putting it into practice it's something completely different mm -hmm. and it's part of the process so i, I really like that part how to be really careful with words but you can see that after you're mm -hmm. involved in it not <laughs> just right. when yeah. writing the and acknowledging the practical use of those words yes. for a grant application right even with the projects um like you can structure a, a project but once you're developing the project it will change because some things work or some things won't um become part of what you want it to so i think the kind the words are powerful right and as someone who does a lot of you know, management and administration now more than I spend time on getting things into Carta or programming. Thinking about these words as part of the technologies and tools of the project, right? Like we weren't we weren't going to be as successful in the project using the tools of synergy or intersection or diversity as we were of sort of centering or if we'd had access to it, a kind of borderlands idea. Um, and so like you know, it's not just like having the right server, it's also mm -hmm. like having the right words. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I think that's part of this idea of, you know, taking, you know, the contingency, right? Like, who are the people, right? Like, mm -hmm. Myth had this mission statement, so some of the language came in there. Mm -hmm. The Humanities Center at Maryland was named mm -hmm. Synergy, so some mm -hmm. of the language came in there, right? And to be able to understand the contingencies of all that construction that became at you. And then sort of pick it apart and understand the way that it was part of the technology of the project. Mm -hmm. um, it's something, yeah, that you can only do in retrospect, but um, <laughs> that it is part of, you know, doing DH work is how you mobilize that language. Mm -hmm. So, would you say that that's been like one of the like the biggest challenge for you as a director of of the center and and as the dean of the of digital humanities at your university and trying to bridge those two things together? Yes. I mean, and I, I guess I've come to see it as, you know, problems over who has access to the server or mm -hmm. who is employed by who and for how long, or what, you know, rate as flowing from these sort of conceptual problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that most days if you called me up and said, like, what's your biggest problem? I'd be like, ah, oh, I'm going to. <laughs> shake my fist at you know the university budgeting system or something mm -hmm. right but like what it actually is mm -hmm. is like what is the frame and the conceptual idea of like what is our work and how do we do it right um so yeah as director i try to come back to that right there's um in, because we've been in, like in, invested right now in this issue of like talking about you know Ansaldua and like third world feminists or, I'd also like to bring to the table the work of Mariana Ortega, who also has, she has an article, um, I think, I don't remember, the, I was trying to find the, the title of it, but it's something like longing and, and but it starts off with that, but I'll add it to, to, the, to our, our Twitter later on. But it talks about how you have to check yourself in, and I see like the value statement as once you propose Right, that once once you have all these allies who are working to change, you know, paradigms and perspectives and, and imageries, she also calls on us to be checking in, right, to consistently check to make sure that we are doing the work that it, that we are proposing that gets done. And so a lot of times we're very influential in, in making, you know, all these value statements and these, you know, changes mm -hmm. to the language, but a lot of times we fail at checking in to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. So in that sense, I am you know, very grateful for the work that you're doing. And that's why I wanted to ask you that question at the end to see, because I know it, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, as an administrator and the person who's on the field, you know, trying to work, you know, do all of these things at the same time um, can be very taxing and difficult, but, uh, but it's, it's extremely necessary because it's not just on paper, it's very real for, I mean, for, for, the, for your center, we see that as like the our mission. You know, we will have a mission for the Digital Humanities Center that it's very much a value statement that a lot of times doesn't really um, 
correspond with the university's initiatives, right, or, or statement that the university will launch. Yeah, and I'm I'm really grateful to the MIF team. Mm -hmm. Yes, Purdom and Kirsten and Stephanie, mm -hmm. especially, immediately go to that question of like, yeah. all right, how do we check in with this value mm -hmm. statement? Mm -hmm. um, how do we enact <clears throat> this? Um, right. And also for me, as someone who had been been in MIF for longer, um, <coughs> the process of doing this value statement and doing that work of checking in mm -hmm. has been useful in saying, ah, here are the things I see because I am embedded in the structure yes. mm -hmm. that people who are new to this don't see. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work about, well, here's how it has always been possible to mm -hmm. collaborate with MIT, mm -hmm. but it was a kind of late knowledge. You had to kind of figure out how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so being more explicit and saying like, here are the mechanisms, like our, one of our values is collaboration. Like, here are some of the mechanisms mm -hmm. by which um, you can do that. And I think at certain times, we've been reluctant to say them explicitly out of a sort of fear of capacity, mm -hmm. right? If we tell people how to collaborate with us, they'll want to collaborate with yes. us. How will we be able to do all the work? Yeah. Um, but also like to not be explicit about mm -hmm. those mechanisms means they're available to some people mm -hmm. and not available to others based mm -hmm. on kind of latent knowledge that they have of the institution or the power dynamics of their position. Um, so yeah, the, the rest of the MIF team has really pushed me to think about that idea of checking in. Um, do we have any other questions? No? Thank you so much, President. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just ask, before you leave, I just want to make an announcement about the next series of the next uh, speakers in the series. So we will have Thomas Padilla coming in on uh, October 26th. Then we will have uh, Jennifer Giuliano visit us in November. And at the end, towards the end of November, Julia Flanders will also uh, visit us. Um, of course, this would have never been possible without the support of Octopus and the Press of Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project and the wonderful work of um, Don Waters and Patricia Shway at the Mellon Foundation who have uh, generously given us a planning grant to visit centers throughout the U.S., the Jewish Humanities Centers, to bring the consultants and speakers to, to start this series and, um, and to make this available for um, anybody in the U.S. who's doing that, U.S. Latin literature, um, the Jewish humanities. So thank you again, Trevor, oh, for your you. generosity, and thanks everyone for watching us. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, now we get to free lunch. <laughs> thank you. It was awesome. Yeah. I, you know, I, I benefited a lot from the question.